Hi, um, I think I've met most of you. I'm Gavin Givanoni. I'm the professor of neurology at um, uh, at Bart's MS. Just to explain to you that the term Bart's MS is meant to be an umbrella term, and it covers both our activities in relation to multiple sclerosis in the medical school in the research unit, uh, as well as in the hospital or the NHS side of things. And so when we start talking about um, the various MS activities we do, uh, we were confusing people because people didn't know if we we're talking about the same thing when we mentioned the medical school or the hospital. So Bart's MS basically covers all our activities around uh, MS. I'm aware that uh, we would love to be doing this teaching course with all of you on site so we could show you our unit and where we work face-to-face uh, uh, -face. but as we're doing this virtually I'd just like to give you a quick background view of where we work uh, and the kind of environment uh, we work in to get you to get you a feel for uh, what to expect over the next two days. So we're very proud of our hospital um, the Royal London Hospital, which used to be called the London, um, has been around for almost 300 years uh, in one form or another. Our current uh, activities on the so-called Whitechapel site, which is E1 in London, the postcode E1 for East London 1, um, is uh, a bit, we've been here for over 260 years. And as you can see in this um, poster celebrating the history of the Royal London Hospital, you can see we um, were founded in 1740. Now it's very important to realize that the London was started as the first charitable hospital in the UK. In other words, it was opened regardless for people who, regardless of uh, whether or not they could afford to pay for healthcare. So it is kind of the front runner of the NHS and the board of governors that ran our hospital were very reluctant to allow any private practice to occur on site. That has changed over the last 15 years. But prior to um, us merging with um, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which that's why we were called Barts in the London, um, that's in the city of London, you know, we, we, we were not allowed to do any private practice uh, on our premises. As you can see, we moved into a purpose-built purpose building in 1757, and we recently, in 2012, moved out of that into a brand new uh, purpose-built hospital. Um, which was built um, under the new uh, uh, NHS um, infrastructure development called PFI. It was a private funded initiative. Um, as you can see, when the hospital was originally opened up, there was nothing around it. And there's a reason for that, and I'll show you. It was built outside of the city of London uh, in the fields, essentially. But our hospital is very famous. Um, it's well known for several reasons. I, you may remember Down syndrome. So John Langdon Down was a, a pediatric pediatrician who worked at our hospital, and he described Down syndrome. You may have also heard about Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man. So the Elephant Man um, uh, was found by one of our uh, clinicians. Um, um, Frederick Treves, and he was in a freak show um, uh, near the Whitechapel tube station. And because he was being used as a, um, a way of making money, Joseph uh, Frederick Treves felt very sorry for him and brought him into the hospital. And he, he was actually housed and lived and died uh, in the Royal uh, London Hospital in a section of the hospital called the Grocer's Wing. Importantly, the hospital uh, remains, the old hospital, the front of it is listed uh, and it's been converted into a, uh, a new facility uh, for our, count, our town council. It's going to be our council buildings. Other things that we're famous for is light therapy for treating tuberculosis. We were the first hospital to have uh, x-rays for diagnostic reasons. Um, uh, and it has a long tradition of uh, supporting uh, education. Just to say to you, it became the Royal London Hospital uh, um, back in 1990, and that's when the Queen became the patron of the hospital. To be called Royal, you have to have some patronage from the Queen. Um, <clears throat> Just to put it into con context, so when the London Hospital came about, uh, it was in Georgia and London, and you can see Georgia and London was relatively small. 
This is the Te river. Let me just get my pointer. This is the River Thames. Um, this here refers to the Tower of London. This is South London. So this is a, an area of London that um, wasn't considered to be part of the city of London. And um, if you go from the tower, you'll see this road passing outwards. This would almost certainly be Whitechapel High Street. And our hospital would uh, sit in this particular position over here right now. Okay, and this um, uh, this is why when you saw that picture previously, this picture over here, um, there was nothing around it because it was built outside of the confines of the city in London, okay, uh, in fields. Georgian London rapidly expanded, and so this is now moving to Victorian London, and I put it up because uh, I, I'd like to highlight this area. This is Whitechapel High Street. That's where the London Hospital is, and these... Uh, uh, red dots here represent something quite sinister. Uh, this is in 1888, and almost everybody I know um, uh, has heard about Jack the Ripper. And so Jack the Ripper um, killed these five prostitutes in uh, 1888, um, in 1888 uh, in the Whitechapel area. Uh, um, one, one thing I always point out, we normally run these teaching courses in a site um, off the commercial road. Is it, we, we hire a teaching venue um, because it's convenient for us. Uh, and it's really around the, uh, where our teaching venue is, which is called Imperanda. One of the uh, murders is actually on the side street around ne next door. And this was Elizabeth Stroud who was murdered on the, on the uh, 1 a.m. on Sunday, the 30th of September, 1888. So if you ever come to London, I would urge you to come visit Whitechapel. It's one of the most interesting uh, parts of London because of its history. And you can actually book a, a Jack the Ripper walking tour and go to all these uh, sites uh, to see uh, where J uh, Jack the Ripper murdered these prostitutes. Just to point out to you that um, uh, this area is very, very not only only for Jack the Ripper, but it's historical for other areas. Um, Whitechapel really was part of the docks. We're very close to the docks, and this is where um, waves of immigration occurred into London. And so we have uh, um, uh, a history of immigrants coming through London, including Eastern European Jewish migration. Uh, we had the French Huguenots, and the French Huguenots came in when they were persecuted for religious reasons in France. And they uh, uh, arrived in this area of Whitechapel um, called Spitalfields, to be honest with you. And if you do come to London, I would urge you to uh, go and visit the uh, the French Quarter uh, off Brick Lane. Now, Brick Lane has now been taken over by uh, mainly South Asian, particularly Indian and Pakistani uh, restaurants, and it's very famous for that. But there's a tiny little street called Fournier Street where you can see with the buildings the French Huguenots built. And these are all uh, grade one or two listed buildings and it's really, very beautiful. And the, this particular part of London, is uh, this Fashion Street, is very, very famous for the rag trade, clothing trade. And that was brought to London by the French Huguenots. Um, <clears throat> If you go up Commercial Street, you'll see there's an old brewery. Yeah, it's not functional. You can actually hire this brewery, the Truman Brewery. And we can go up to Shoreditch. Uh, and Shoreditch has become famous because um, we have this area in Shoreditch called the Old Street Roundabout, which is now called the Silicon Roundabout. And this is now um, the second biggest technology or, uh, hub, essentially software tech industry uh, outside of Silicon Valley in, in California. And it's kind of the European hub for uh, the tech industry, particularly FinTech, but also medical technology. So if you are um, involved in developing uh, uh, medical apps, uh, chances are you will be hiring one of the um, tech companies uh, uh, around the old street roundabout. And for example, Google uh, um, has one of their incubator hubs uh, uh, um, on the on the uh, Old Street roundabout, so it's a very exciting time to be in London and be part of the London tech industry, particularly as we're hoping to innovate in the MS space to try and improve or change the way we manage MS using technology. And clearly, this has been driven by the COVID nineteen pandemic. And hopefully, over the next few days, uh, when you're on the uh, online course, uh, we'll go through some of the rapid changes we've had to adopt into clinical practice during COVID nineteen. Um, 
What I also want to point out that um, the uh, Royal London, the London Hospital was built first, but we built a, a, a medical school opened up uh, on campus, and our, our medical college, the old one, was uh, um, next to the hospital, and we now have a new campus, and this is where we based. We based in the so-called Blizzard Institute, which is just behind the Royal London Hospital, next to the Royal London Hospital, and we refer to this uh, as a as a Whitechapel campus. Stepney Way, so this is Stepney Way, this road that runs behind the hospital and between the hospital and the medical school is called Stepney Way, okay, and uh, he has an old church and this church is actually our uh, medical school library and we also have our museum embedded in that and also on Stepney Way is the uh, original London College, the first uh, medical school to open in the UK. And there's our brand new hospital, and this is looking down Stepney Way, and there's a, a bridge under, uh, under, uh, over the road, and this is the uh, um, this is the uh, South Tower, and the North Tower is you can't be seen. A very important landmark. That building there is where I actually am sitting right now, recording this lecture. is called the Blizzard Institute. This glass box, but in front of it is this uh, pub. Uh, called the uh, Good Samaritan, and this is actually owned by a barge charity, and this is actually a very important part of our uh, medical school life because this is where everybody meets to celebrate graduation, finishing exams, etc. And on a, on a summer evening, when this picture was taken, in a normal summer evening, there would be people spilled out into the road um, um, from this pub, and unfortunately, because of COVID-19, they are very the, uh, the pub's actually closed right now. I would normally take you on a tour into the medical school and just show you this wall. This is basically a timeline of our medical schools. Um, as you probably know, our medical school is Bart's and the London. Bart's refers to St. Bartholomew's Medical School that merged with the London to become a bigger medical school. But St. Bartholomew's Hospital is actually the oldest hospital in Britain. It opened up in 1123. Okay. It was refounded by Henry VIII in 1546, and that happened after the uh, dissolution of the monasteries by um, Henry VIII. As you know, uh, he was responsible for uh, uh, Britain coming out of the Catholic Church and uh, launching the, the Church of England. Just to say, the first record of pupils actually training at Bart's Hospital, which is in the city, was in 1662. Okay. Here again is our uh, the London uh, opening up in 1740, and the medical school opened up 45 years later. The London Hospital Medical College um, was established by the surgeon William Blizzard. Please note Blizzard spelt with one Z. Okay, uh, and I'll show you that he were and uh, the institute I'm actually working in is called the Blizzard Institute, named after him. <clears throat> um. The, the St. Bartholomew's Medical School was formally opened in 1822, so that was about 37 years after our medical school. So although uh, Bart's like to claim they're the oldest hospital, they're not the oldest medical school uh, in the country. Okay. Um, and just to say to you, in uh, 1892 and 1893, club unions were formed at both of these two medical schools. Okay. And these are the precursors to the uh, Students' Association. So all our medical students and dental students belong to the Students' Association. And they're responsible for what we would call extracurricular activities for the medical students, sports clubs, uh, debating societies, uh, etc. Okay. Just to say the dental hospital opened up in 1911, just before the First World War. And yeah, we can see women were admitted to our hospital uh, for the first time in eight, 1918. And that's an important milestone because our um, uh, medical school is very proud of the fact that it uh, supports female education and now more recently uh, education in ethnic minority groups. And we're the one medical school where we have more ethnic minority uh, uh, people, those are people from black, Asian or eth uh, other ethnic minorities than we do have uh, the Caucasian or so-called white uh, British people attending. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, we have the Medical College of St. Bartholomew's. Um, I'm not going to be, I wouldn't have taken you across to the to the Charterhouse site, which is in the city of London. Um, 
and this was uh, um, acquired from the Merchant Tailors School. And Merchant Tailors refers to one of the guilds uh, in the city of London. Just to say to you, in 1948, the NHS was established. Uh, and as you know, the NHS has three founding principles. It is uh, equity. In other words, it doesn't matter who you are, you get uh, NHS. Um, it's free of it's free at uh, uh, a point, uh, at, at point of delivery, and it's paid out of general taxation. You know, so the most important principle of the NHS is it doesn't matter who you are. Okay, you get free healthcare. And the other important thing about the uh, NHS, it, it builds on the platform of healthcare being a basic human right. So everybody is everybody under the NHS charter. Okay, is entitled to uh, free healthcare. Just to say, uh, um, the London Hospital Medical College, uh, the London Medical School, and St. Bartholomew's merged in 1995. Okay, uh, that's uh, almost 26 years ago to become uh, one medical school. And we, and we uh, joined a university, Queen Mary University of London. In the past, the medical schools in London were independent. Uh, they were essentially uh, uh, centers of learning or education that were independent of universities. And we're now under this uh, university called Queen Mary. <clears throat> um, just to say to you that our Cancer Institute, uh, for those of you interested in oncology, opened in 2003 um, uh, and the Blizzard building where I'm based was uh, in 2005 and I joined this uh, institution the year after this opened in 2006. So I've been here now, uh, you know, over 15 years. <clears throat> Just to say to you, another institute, the William Harvey, opened in 2011. Okay. And the dental school opened, the new dental school opened in 20, uh, um, 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 2014. And we also opened up a new medical school, um, well, a new campus, uh, and that's at, uh, at Goiza in Malta. So we now have a, uh, um, a intake of 32 medical st uh, students that go to the Malta campus. If you were on site, I would almost certainly be taking you into the Doniach Gallery, uh, Doniach Gallery. And the reason why I would be taking you in because the Elephant Man, <clears throat> okay, uh, Joseph Merrick, uh, who was saved by Treves and brought to the uh, London Hospital, uh, his skeleton is preserved and on show. Unfortunately, um, when this was actually open to the public in our general museum, we had literally hundreds or even thousands of visitors coming in a week to gawk and look at the skeleton. And because uh, the elephant man had been in a freak show and saved from the freak show and brought into London Hospital, um, the governors of the um, hospital thought it would be inappropriate uh, to have a freak show around the skeleton. So the skeleton, although it's available for viewing, it's for private viewing. We now know that this, um, the conditions, so the DNA was sequenced from the skeleton and uh, this particular condition um, the elephant man has is called Proteus syndrome and it's due to a uh, mutation uh, in the AKT gene, uh, uh, and it's actually um, a mutation that occurs after fertilization because if it's a germline mutation, um, cells aren't viable. And this is one of the reasons why um, it, it, it causes deformities or uncontrolled growth of skeletal and soft tissue in certain parts of the body because it causes mosaicism. If you're interested in the elephant man, you can watch several movies. I think there have been three different versions of the movie Elephant Man. Or you can watch um, on the Discovery Channel um, uh, a documentary and it's on YouTube for free. I'll show you a clip where they've actually um, modeled the Elephant Man based on the skeleton.
Peter Elliot Schroeder has volunteered to be placed under the same physical constraints as Joseph Martin. Anyway, I'm not going to go through the whole video with you. But just to say to you, just to say to you, though, um, um, there is a bit of history attached to our medical school, which we're very proud of. Now, coming back to MS, so Dr. Russell Brain, who later became Lord Brain, was my predecessor. He was the first professor of neurology at the London Hospital and lived from uh, 1895 to 1966. Uh, and what makes him famous in MS is that he wrote a monograph called uh, Disseminating uh, uh, Sclerosis in 1930, which was published in the Quarterly Journal of uh, Medicine. And this was probably the definitive text in terms of medical text in the English literature uh, on multiple sclerosis. And uh, I've actually read it, uh, and it's a remarkable piece of writing. And everything he wrote down uh, clinically is what we use today in clinical practice. Um, Law Brain's monograph uh, has, um, was surpassed by the publication of, a, of the McAlpine's textbook. Anyway, this is a picture of the Blizzard Institute where I work, ultra modern. Um, it was a, a building that was designed and built by Will Olsop, a very famous British architect. And the year this was um, uh, opened, uh, it won a major architectural award. It's a glass box and it was initially called the Institute of Cell and Molecular Science because the building was meant to represent a, a cell. <clears throat> and it's named after Thomas Blizzard Curling, Thomas Blizzard. Uh, and he was a surgeon at the Royal London Hospital uh, in 1883 and a full surgeon in 1849. And uh, as you probably know, surgeons uh, trained in a different way to physicians back then. They came through the uh, so-called barber route, and that's why surgeons are still called Mr. and not doctors. Um, he was very, f what made him famous actually was his seminal work on tetanus, and he won a prize, the Jacksonian Prize, for his work on tetanus. And so, um, but anyway, he was very, very well known uh, and famous for uh, uh, his surgical skills uh, and for treating diseases of the testes. This is actually a, a picture of our uh, laboratories. So that if you go into our, our, our building, you can actually look at the labs from above, ultra-modern laboratories, open plan. And on the side here, we have all the closed laboratories. Um, we have the, um, in the center of our building, we have this thing called the nucleus, which is where people meet. And this is kind of the area where you move off to the different parts of our institute. And above here, you see this uh, uh, structure with lights and this is meant to represent chromatin and this is meant to be represent a nucleolus. We have this part in the top of the sky and um, it's meant to I think represent a mitochondrion and we have two meeting rooms in there that we can have uh, for meetings or lectures to students and at the back we have this building called the spiky that black structure this is what it looks like. Again, it's meant to represent an organelle. I suspect it's meant to be a lysosome and in there we have a, a, a lecture a lecture theater or meeting room. This is our lecture theater attached to the Blizzard Institute. Um, ultra modern again, it's got amazing acoustics. And uh, I normally take you in there and show you how good the acoustics are. Even if you whisper down front, you can hear it at the back, mainly because of these structures that uh, reflect the sound. It's all green because it's meant to represent a poppy field uh, with these red chairs, a poppy field. Uh, and it's meant to represent one of the, uh, uh, the uh, Flanders, for example, or one of the battle scenes in the First World War, and it's named after Perrin. It's called the Perrin Lecture Theatre, and Perrin was one of our professors of medicine at uh, Barts. Uh, he was a chair of governors as well, and chair of the Medical Council, and he actually uh, fought uh, in, the, in, in the First World War. So this is actually a building or a lecture theatre that's dedicated to the memory of the um, uh, Barts and the London alumni uh, that fought and died in the First World War. The structure, which is meant to be, it's called the center of the cell, and it's uh, meant to be a morula. Uh, you can, as you know, a morula is an 18 or 16 cell embryo, and these little brown structures are, represent cells. It's got a little entrance that goes in, and you can look down onto the labs underneath, and the whole purpose of this is a public engagement uh, facility. So we get children from local schools or schools coming here, and inside there, there's an audiovisual uh, demonstration 
of science and research. And the whole purpose of this is to encourage uh, young children um, to follow science, STEM subjects, uh, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, uh, to encourage them. Because at the end of the day, the British government realized um, that people were not taking STEM subjects, and they had this active campaign to try and promote STEM subjects to get more people to uh, study them at school and to study them at university or postgraduate level. And the uh, government uh, campaign has been very successful. We have seen a massive uptake of STEM subjects in our, uh, our students, both at a school and postgraduate, graduate and postgraduate level. And we think we're a little bit part of that history because uh, this was funded by a government uh, lottery grant. And, and we've had literally over 120,000 school children coming through our Blizzard Institute to see science in action and to see our audiovisual um, uh, program to encourage them or to engage them with the wonders of science. <clears throat> just to explain to you, now that was the medical school and the research side of things, uh, just to say to you that uh, um, our hospital is uh, attached to a group of hospital called Bart's Health. We have five hospitals in that, so that's a, a network of hospitals. Um, and the hospitals are the Royal London, St. Bartholomew's, Whips Cross, Newham and Mile End. Uh, in addition, we have about 50 community-based clinics. Uh, we are the uh, regional trauma center and we have an ambulance, air ambulance service attached to our hospital. We also have specialized heart and cancer hospitals, which are based on the uh, BART's site. Uh, we see over one, one and a half million patients annually in terms of outpatient appointments, a half a million A&E appointments. And just to show you how big we are, our maternity services deliver over 15,000 children a year. And um, we have amazing 14,000 staff. So we are by far the largest NHS uh, trust or group of hospitals in, in the UK with the largest budget. And MS is just a tiny part of that uh, activity. As you know, the NHS uh, turned 70 in 2018, and there were uh, celebrations in our hospital around that. This was just a wall of pictures celebrating um, historical moments uh, of the London Hospital in the NHS history. We are probably the most diverse area of the country, uh, simply because the East End of London has been well known for its diversity. And when you come into our hospital, you get a welcome sign in how many languages? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, t 10 different languages. Um, anyway, if you come into our hospital, um, you go off to the 11th floor, I will take you up the, the elevators and we would arrive there. And this is our neurology day unit in our clinical research facility. And we share it with plastic surgery who has their on the other side, but 11D is really our unit. This is our waiting room, uh, and we have another waiting room inside the unit where patients wait to be seen. This is the mom, our uh, administrator, uh, and she would uh, meet you at reception. This is one of our junior doctors. This is what the corridor looks like going into our uh, infusion unit. This was our previous um, uh, uh, manager. She left us uh, just after COVID-19, well, halfway through COVID-19, Anya. This is what one of our uh, assessment rooms looks like. We have an examination couch. This is where we do our lumbar punctures or any procedures. This is one of our infusion units. This, uh, These are, actually, to be honest with you, IVRG and natalizumab infusion chairs. Uh, uh, and you can see we we can accommodate quite a few people in, the, in this infusion unit. I want to point out that... Um, now, losing our patients often get to know each other. And I like to call it the social disease modifying therapy. And the reason being is we, people don't just come in here and keep quiet. They introduce themselves, they become friendly, and they look forward to seeing each other uh, when they come up for the infusions, either four or six weekly. And uh, uh, the, it's such an important aspect of that losing infusion that when one particular patient um, has to delay the infusion by a week, quite a few of their friends uh, also want to delay their infusion so they don't uh, uh, miss out or, or, or lose contact with their friends. Uh, we've even had that lose about marriages, uh, people get, meeting and getting married to each other from meeting each other in this unit. Uh, we've had people um, uh, um, 
become best friends and become godparents to their children, etc. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic because a few years ago we tried to set up a Natalizumab Tysabri home infusion service and we had very few takers. And I think the reason for that is that the home infusion uh, of Natalizumab broke down the social aspects of the therapy. So this is one of the things about infusion units. Uh, there's more to them than just coming in for your infusion. There's the social aspect and a lot of our patients love their uh, half a day off or day off from work you know every four to six weeks to come up for their infusions uh, and um, you know simply moving a treatment from uh, an infusion to a subcutaneous or to home infusion service misunderstands that there are other aspects to healthcare apart from the uh, efficiency of delivering the service or the therapy <clears throat> yeah, we've got two of those rooms and this is our um, uh, uh, alemtuzumab, ocrelizumab. So when you have to be in hospital for much longer and there's a risk of infusion reactions, um, we have these uh, um, uh, bigger beds that are, can be, uh, they can be made flat so people can sleep on them. Uh, and again, you can see there are uh, six in this six, six. Uh, so we're limited to the number of patients we can infuse in our anemtuzumab, ocrelizumab suite. Um, and uh, um, at any one time, this room will uh, be full in the week uh, with patients coming up for the infusions. This is our um, clinical research facility right next door to our um, infusion suite. We have this. Um, uh, a unit where we do research and see our trial patients. The important thing about this unit is that it's been built so that it can be used as a grade, uh, as a, um, uh, a phase one unit where we could potentially do uh, normal volunteers, uh, also overnight uh, stays for uh, monitoring if, if necessary. <clears throat> and there's two, two cubicles for that. This is just um, um, showing you our prep room and this is uh, usually done the day before um, this is the trolley that's been prepared for uh, uh, lumbar puncture just to point out um, that we based in London but we don't only service London we service um, areas outside London and most as, uh, neurology or MS services in the, in the in the UK are based on what we call a hub and spoke model. We have the hub, which is a neuroscience center. We're very close to another one at Queen's Hospital in Romford. And there's the next one is Cambridge. But we get a lot of our patients from the uh, referral hospitals that are based in Colchester, Harlow, Chelmsford, Basildon and Southend. Uh, we do overlap with each other. Uh, some patients uh, choose to go to Cambridge, uh, but overall, it's e often easier in terms of trail uh, train links to get into the to the London, uh, and so we get um, a lot of patients having to travel in from quite distant areas uh, to be uh, diagnosed, assessed, and managed for the MS. What we have done, uh, particularly with COVID nineteen, is set up these virtual uh, uh, multidisciplinary team meetings where we can assess patients remotely. Uh, using uh, um, a web-based platform, we use, um, uh, I think it's uh, Silver Leaf, if I forget the name, um, that our radiology department uses uh, where we can review patients uh, and review their, uh, and since we've actually set up our virtual clinic online, um, we've actually had a much better attendance, interestingly, on the virtual online ones, simply because people don't have to travel. But in our referral patch, um, we cover a population of um, about one, close to two million uh, um, uh, now. Uh, we think the prevalence of MS in the region is about 150 to 100,000, 100, which means um, there's a prevalence of about uh, uh, two and a half thousand patients. We have an incidence in the area of about uh, eight, 100,000, which means we see between 110 and 145 new patients uh, per year. Um, according to uh, guidelines in the United Kingdom, uh, we should have three, actually have 315 patients per uh, MS clinical nurse specialist. Um, and we therefore have too few MS nurses in our area. 
Um, but at the moment, we have it between seven and eight and a half full-time MS nurse specialists covering this area to manage uh, our patient load. I want to point out to you that the uh, one, of, one of the reasons why we had to get into a hospital in 2012 was because we were the official hospital for the London Olympics. And literally uh, 10 minutes down the line, down the road on, the, on a tube, uh, or you can even cycle there, is Olympic Park. Um, and so if you do come to London, I'd urge you to visit us uh, at the Whitechapel site. Uh, and instead of moving to West London, to Oxford Street for your shopping, you can go out to the uh, uh, Olympic Park or Olympic Campus, and there's a big shopping uh, centre there. And it's becoming increasingly popular because it's uh, easier to get to than uh, and to navigate than some parts of West London. So that's just a, uh, a rapid tour of um, our Whitechapel campus. Uh, and I... Uh, just to kind of explain to you what we do and our geographical footprint. And clearly, if you've got any questions, you can ask them to me when I give my introductory talk uh, 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 next week. So I look forward to seeing you all online. Take care.